Hello and welcome back to my channel. Um, Socks is here. It's Sunday and we're sitting quietly in my uh, study. Honestly, Socks demands attention from everyone all the time and as soon as there's a camera there, he skips away. Look, here he is. Nope, not bothered. You could purr into my microphone, Socks. How do you think about, how do you feel about that? Not bothered. He's going to settle. I've got coffee. And I've got a pile of books to talk through. I thought I'd do a um, another spooky books um, collection. I've grabbed things off my shelf, various shelves, and uh, gone back into double stacked paperbacks to find particular titles because um, I thought I'd um, dig out some Guy N. Smith. I have a small but perfectly formed collection of Guy N. Smith paperbacks, which I'm... Uh, very proud of. Hold on. And also, Peter Saxon, who um, I might have mentioned before. I haven't read all of these. Um, it's a finite collection from the early 70s that um, uh, is about a kind of spooky, super-powered team in swinging London. I think that's that might be the whole set. They, uh, thinking about it, it's about 10 or 15 years ago, I collected these up, having read about them online, on Kurt Purcell's Groovy Age of Horror website, which I loved. Now, these were published in, uh, in Manchester, which seems amazing uh, to think of now that we had presses and we had publishers here. They were they were both um, created and physically created here. Uh, this is Vampire's Moon. I think this one is, isn't linked. Maybe it is. I get mixed up now with the order of these. This is a... Well, when is it? 70? The shadow of vampire of the vampire prince and his legion of ghouls darkened the tiny village high in the mountains of Romania. Far from civilization, the vampire prince held sway over the superstitious peasants. They helped him lure two visiting American girls into his bat-infested lair. The girls didn't believe in vampires. By the time they began to believe, it was too late. Um. Peter Saxon is, I believe, a pen name for a whole gang of writers. I love the idea of that, a gaggle of um, freelancers all working under the same name. That's a great lurid cover. Curse of Rathlaw. Now this is a, it's the Scottish one, isn't it? <clears throat> the anguished triple curse was as old as evil itself. Yep, it's uh, the Guardians, this super-powered team. Uh, going off to Scotland, Through the Dark Curtain, an occult novel of the supernatural. Um, here's the Guardians again. Out of the dim and ancient past, something hideous had been loosed upon the English countryside, through the dark curtain between bustling modern London and the old oak groves, where druid priests created dark magic, there came a desperate, anguished cry for help. Only the Guardians could hear and answer it, their battleground, the shadowy frontier, where the light of knowledge fades into the dark depths of the supernatural, across the eons to the age when Boudicca was queen. In two dimensions of time, in flesh and spirit, the battle must rage. Good against evil, darkness. It just sounds great. The Vampires of Finisterre. This is the slightly... Goodness. There's a... Um... A sexy looking gentleman on the front. Vampirism, witchcraft, black magic, voodoo, sorcery. It's like a checklist of everything good. I wish there was a description of the different um, characters who form the Guardians. There's a kind of spooky supernatural woman who's very glamorous, who can read minds. There's a young raffish fella who's a reporter, I think. Um, an older, bold... Uh, uh, a cult fella, 
kind of a wizard, I think, a mysterious businessman, a little um, roughy tufty fellow who beats people up. <clears throat> they should have been filmed. It should have been an ITC serial. The Haunting of Alan May. Uh, yep, here are the Guardians again. They, uh, an amusing investigation of a haunted house turns to nightmare as guardian Anne Ashby is transformed into a st sadistic wanton focus of the malignant, malignant force of an ancient curse and an enemy to her fellow guardians. Of course, with every super team, you have to have them turn against each other at some point. Dark Ways to Death is the last in this small sequence. Uh, yep. The four men and the one woman known as the Guardians are pledged to wage war against Satanism, black magic and witchcraft wherever in the world, blah, blah, blah. And they're based in Soho, I think, in, in kind of swinging late 60s. It should have been a series, I'm casting it in my head, a kind of um, black magic version of the Avengers. Anyway, uh, other spookies. Now, here's someone I really like. This is about 20 years ago I was reading her. She's an Australian writer, Kim Wilkins. And this was The Resurrectionists, which is, I think her four novels that I read at the time were all set in Britain. And they were well-researched, digging into history and magic and folklore. This is the one set in uh, North Yorkshire, partly. Bits of Whitby involved. Um, the one, the first one I read, oh, something Angel, I must look it up. And it's the one about Milton uh, and his daughters, the blind poet Milton, and how they call down an angel. And they have him living in their house, but Milton can't see it. And you have things like the Fire of London and, and just a really good uh, spooky novel that's kind of rooted in history. She's really worth reading. She carried on doing further ones and I think went into kind of contemporary romance after that. I've, I've lost track of what she does these days, but I love those particular books. The Grimoire was another one. And I forget the fourth one I read, but they're all here somewhere. I also dug out um, what I was missing the other day, my, uh, the Barbara Ierson anthology that's mostly uh, Funny, ghostly laughter. I found all the spooky ones. This is a beaver book from 1981. And it's people like James Thurber. But there's a Rosemary Timperley story again. Who's always worth reading. Joan Aiken. Um, yep, so that's, I think that's the whole set of them we've got around the house. Last year I read my first Dean R. Kuntz novel. I can't believe I've never read him before. This is a kind of slightly paranormal psychic detective story, a serial killer tale, which um, I found completely gripping. So well done. I think this is quite early on in his very long career. Uh, when is this? 77. Yeah, so I'm definitely going to read some more of him. J. Anson, 666. This is when I had a run of spooky books that I really enjoyed last summer, I think. I remember sitting in the garden with a pile of, of faded yellowing paperbacks. That's how every summer's spent. But last year, uh, th there was spooky after spooky. And this is Jay Anson, who wrote the book of uh, the um, Amityville Horror. Or did he write the sequel? He wrote one of them. And, uh, and I just, I love those books. Irrationally, I know. But I do. And... Um, I found out that he wrote, not a sequel, but a kind of uh, his own book, a sidestep of another spooky house. Um, and this is a ludicrous thriller. It's about house transported stick by stick, I think. Uh, it's, there's lots of architecture and possessed houses and people becoming paranoid and things reaching out of walls to get possession of people and stained glass and um, actually thinking about it, the Adam Neville book. And the reason I'm thinking about horror and spookiness at the moment is because I'm halfway through this, 
which has possessed me all week last days by Adam Neville. I really love this book. Although in the middle, as it gets to the kind of the heart of the mystery, it's gone a bit police procedural in places. We get a lot of murder scene stuff. And it's interesting to me because that's how his books ended up being packaged. Um, you know, they began like this, looking like modern day horror novels. And uh, when they got their mass market paperback in print, they looked just like uh, police procedurals or thrillers dressed up by the publisher to lure in people, presumably, who would read um, gory police procedurals, but not necessarily supernatural horror. Um, it's interesting. Publishers have no nerve this day, this day and age, in, in, in uh, this era, for publishing horror, at least in the, in the UK. They make them look like something else, thrillers or, or crime. You know, in the old days, horror looked like horror. They had um, jet black covers and, and lurid designs and uh, silver embossed um, titles and authors. Big pictures of rats with slavering bloody fangs and stuff like that. Skulls. Publishers are very nervous about this stuff nowadays. and So they have houses and cars and dark roads and clouds and the moon and um, stuff that looks like it's going to be about just the police. And it's interesting to watch this book veer into that territory in the middle, although we know that there's uh, lots of supernatural stuff behind and it is the faces coming through the walls and the uh, houses being possessed and supernatural beings. Anyway, that's full of it. <laughs> More ways than one. Right, my last bit that I was going to pick out is Guy and Smith and this uh, little heap of his books. I'm missing some that I know I've read and had over the years. I'm kind of weirdly proud of these because um, I've collected them all from about, you know, over the years, usually for about a pound or 20 pence in different places. A monster from Earth or beyond the stars. This is the slime beast. And it's probably my favourite. It's just a unrelenting and horrible monster that eats people. I think in the fens of Norfolk, east coast marshes. Um, and scientists, there's always an older scientist, a younger reporter, and the scientist's um, attractive uh, daughter. And the reporter ends up uh, shagging her usually, and they fight the monster. Probably the old scientist gets eaten at some point, and there's lots of shooting and chasing and police. Uh, and whatever the monster is, whether it's a giant crab or a slime beast or a, a, a vicious supernatural cat, story follows uh, much the same kind of um, course, but there's always atmosphere. There's always an atmosphere of slightly sleazy 1970s Britain, and people racing around and eating Kit Kats and staying in bed and breakfasts and drinking whiskey very late at night um, and shooting guns in the woods at some hideous monster. It's like an X-rated version of, of Doctor Who. And he writes in a kind of Terence Dick style. It's very spare. I suppose what you do is you realise that um, both Guy and Smith and Terence Dick were both, uh, well, not to, to uh, do them disservice, but they were both hacks. They, that they, um, they could turn out books a number per year. And the people they loved were the same. And those people came from the, the tradition of hard-boiled thrillers. And, you know, in, in 1940s, 50s America, those are the books they loved and grew up with. And you can hear that, those voices, in the back of these, the kind of terse, um, two-fisted, um, pulpy noir that this, this belongs to. So I've always got respect for that. And those books make me laugh because they're just so action-packed. It's one chapter after the next with dreadful things happening to absolutely everybody involved. She was frightened. If she didn't give him what he wanted, he would take it any way he could. He was no better than the slime beast. Worse, in fact, 
You knew where you stood was the mud monster. That's a taste of exactly what it's like. Return of the Werewolf, I believe, is quite rare. And sets eBay going crazy when somebody lists it. At least that was the case a few years ago. I got this for two quid somewhere and uh, fell upon it with great glee. Um, it has a touch of the um, American Werewolf in London, I suppose. Um, this is 77, so it predated that. Yep. Caracal, which I read for the first time last year, which is his uh, wild cat. Um, you know, Britain is riven with legends of, of wild cats roaming almost anywhere you can think of. Um, and this is one that eats people. And then his most famous series. I've only got two here. I have got more around the house. <clears throat> but in the tradition of the rats, Night of the Crabs. I think, I'm not sure. I read them out of order. I think this is the first one, 76. And it was a deliberate cash-in on um, James Herbert's success with the rats. This is, I think, even more fun than the rats. There's some hilarious set pieces in this. And you wouldn't believe you'd be so frightened of uh, shellfish, frankly. And Killer Crabs, which has a brilliant cover. They're just so much fun. I wish, this is 78, I think maybe the first sequel. I wish you could go to motorway service shops on long journeys or news agents still, and there'd be the spinning rack of paperbacks and covers as as fun as that, and that they didn't dress up horror to look like that. I wish it was more unabashed. I guess it's embarrassment, isn't it? These are covers that people would be embarrassed to read now because it gives away what it, what kind of thrills they're getting out of it, and they're cheap thrills. And I think there's something in paperback fiction that needs to be cheap and tacky, and and it's not a guilty pleasure. It's just fun. That's out of hell. Another of his from I think the seventies, uh, which I read about seven years ago, in an afternoon, because <laughs> I loved it so much. Um, it's about uh, essentially a pandemic caused by bats, and I do remember thinking with horror when COVID started that it was some kind of when they talked about bat soup, do you remember that? People were having bat soup and that's what possibly caused it. All those kind of stories that were going around in 2020. And I did think with horror about Guy N. Smith and what he must have thought about all of that. He died in recent years. I'm not sure if he died uh, at what point before or after the pandemic. But the advent of COVID had a touch of the Guy N. Smiths about it, I think. More than it had a touch of Stephen King's The Stand or any other horror writer's um, aesthetic. I think it was much more Guy and Smith, especially when they talked about poor pangolins. In the 70s, they'd have some terrible pangolin revenge novel. Here's one of my favorite books about horror, Brady Hendrix and his paperbacks from hell. In, oh, this must be seven or eight years ago I read this. It's such a lavish book. And it becomes such a dreadful checklist of things that you want to, oh, that you wish you could go and, um, look at these, these, the American covers, go and find the American covers for Guy and Smith, which if anything are even more lurid. I think the, uh, that whole genre of animals going wild and eating everybody is my favorite in horror. Brady Hendrix throughout this divides the, um, oh look, they is talking about the Guardians series. Um, he divides them into different um, broad genres when animals attack, real estate nightmares, weird science, inhumanoids, splatterpunks, um, creepy kids, and I think the kind of satanic children 
genre of the 70s is one of my favourites, the kind of omens and exorcists and Rosemary's Babies. But the animals as well just make me uh, laugh. And I think it's because uh, they're so removed from reality and that that's why we um, go to horror. It's frightening, but it's not too close to our reality. You know, with a bit of luck, we're not going to be eaten by um, giant rats or even medium-sized rats. Anyway, <laughs> that's my theory on, on horror. Um, I've got loads of other things in the same genre I want to talk about. And uh, fantasy as well. Somebody mentioned the other day, this is Beowulf by Rosemary Sutcliffe. Now, I'd mentioned Sutcliffe in connection with something else the other day. And in the comments, somebody said, oh, I read Beowulf when I was at school by her. And so did I, I re remembered, when I was about 11. And it might have been an edition like this, a school edition. And she tells it so well. The thing about Rosemary Sutcliffe is I believe she was confined to a wheelchair all of her life and was in some physical discomfort, if not pain, all the time, for whatever, from whatever condition she suffered from. And the story is that she used to handwrite painfully all of her books, and she'd do draft after draft, copying them out, which beggars belief, you know, for softies like me in the current age with our word processors. But I do remember uh, this being a wonderful and lurid version of Beowulf that lets you into the, the you know, this old English saga. Otherwise, you would have to read as, uh, you know, dreadful long poem 